sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Are you walking in the light today? Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for the awesome privilege of being in your house. We thank you for your holy Sabbath, where we can just take a break for 24 whole hours from our own endeavors, from our own words, from our own activities. We ask, Father, that as we open your word and study about the final apostasy, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide our thoughts. And we thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to begin our study this morning by referring to a text which I probably quote more than any text from Scripture. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Basically, this is after Adam and Eve had sinned. God has come down to the garden and he is addressing the serpent. And what he's saying is that he is going to send a seed born of a woman to this world. And that seed is going to do battle with Satan, with the serpent, with the devil. In the process of the battle, the seed of the woman is going to be wounded on his heel. But the head of the serpent is going... In other words, God is serving Satan notice. He's saying, you led man into sin. You're going to cause misery on planet Earth. But I'm warning you that I'm sending a seed to the world who is going to do battle with you. In that battle, you're going to hurt him. He is going to crush your head. From that point on, the devil decided that he was not going to allow that seed to come. And so basically... Satan used two different methods to try and keep the seed from coming during the Old Testament period. Two methods. The first method we find in the story of Cain and Abel. You see, when, when uh, Abel lived in harmony with God's principles, the devil soon discovered that Abel probably wasn't the seed, but he was going to bring through a lineage the seed into the world. And so it was not convenient for the devil to have Abel living. And so we're told in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8, if you go with me there, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8, Now Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So the first method that the devil uses is to try and destroy the seed by person to person. He tries to kill the seed. And in this case, he was successful with Abel. Of course, he was not ultimately successful because we're told in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 25, that God gave Eve another seed, and the name of that seed was Seth. By killing the seed through whom 
the seed would eventually come into the world. So the devil soon discovers that by killing the seed, he's not going to accomplish his purposes. So he begins to think, there must be a better method of keeping the seed from coming than killing the seed, because I kill the seed and God brings another one. How can I do it? And so now we move to the moment before the flood. Actually, several years before the flood. Notice Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all who they chose. I'm going to stop there for a moment. The sons of God here are the righteous. The daughters of men are the wicked women that are mentioned in the genealogy of Cain. And what the devil is doing here, he's not trying to destroy the sons of God by persecution. He's not trying to annihilate the sons of God. What he's doing is he's blending or mixing the two seeds, the sons of God, that is the righteous, with the daughters of men who are the lineage of the wicked or of the unrighteous. Seed, or blending the two seeds will be more successful than trying to kill the seed. And by the way, this method was diabolically successful. Because when you read the story in Genesis, in spite of the fact that 1,656 years had gone by between creation and the flood, we're told in Genesis that out of all of the millions of people that individually were on planet at that time, because Men lived to be almost a thousand years old. There was no sterility problems. There was no scarcity of food. In other words, it, the, the world was almost in its pristine glory and beauty. There must have been millions of people on planet Earth. It says the whole Earth had become corrupted. We find that out of all of those millions of people that probably were on planet Earth, only eight were still faithful to God. If time had passed, if God had not brought about the flood, the holy line would have disappeared. I continue reading in verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who of old men of renown, or men with a name. They were the same building of the Tower of Babel. The identical expression is used of those who build the Tower of Babel. In other words, a very wicked, powerful race was the result of this mixture of the sons of God with the daughters of men. In fact, we're told in Genesis that as a result of the devil blending these two seeds, the world was almost totally corrupted. Notice Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. It says here, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And notice the end result in society, verses 11 and 12. It says the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their their on the earth. So in the early chapters of Genesis, we notice that the devil uses two methods to try and keep the seed, the promised seed of Genesis 3.15 from coming. Number one, attempt to kill the holy seed. Number two, try to infiltrate and corrupt the seed by mixing or blending them with worldlings, blending them with the unrighteous. And of course, the, the, the righteous with the unrighteous. Every thought of the intents of the heart of man was only evil continually. The earth was filled with violence as a result of this second method of Satan. Now, Satan has used these methods all throughout the course of human history. These are to forsake their allegiance to God. Either kill them or corrupt them. There are many other uh, 
smaller methods, if you please, that the devil uses. But these are the two major methods that the devil uses in the course of human history. Either kill the seed or corrupt the seed. Either destroy the righteous through persecution or else contaminate them through false ideas and through worldly practices. Now there's another example of this that we've studied previously in this series, and that is in the story of Balaam. And this morning I'm going to review some of the things that we've studied before because this is really the, the concluding lecture in the series on great apostasies in the Bible. Notice Numbers chapter 22 and verse 6. Numbers chapter 22 and verse 6. Israel at this point was in a proper relationship with God. In fact, they had a strong covenant relationship with the Lord when they came to the borders of the promised land. They'd learned their lesson. They'd been in the... the ...passed away except for those who were 18 years and younger and Caleb and Joshua. And so now they were in a strong relationship with God. And the devil knew it. And so now the devil is going to attempt to destroy them. And the way that he attempts to do it is by getting Balaam to curse Israel so that then Balak can come against them and destroy them in battle. Notice Numbers 22 and verse 6. This is Balak, the, the king of the, of the Moabites, asking uh, Balaam to come and curse the people. Therefore, please come at once. Curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. In other words, come and curse this people so that I can come against them in battle, and I can defeat them in battle and destroy them. It's interesting to notice the response of Balaam to the request of Balak. Notice Numbers 23 and verses 20 to 23. Behold... He has blessed, that is, God has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He has not, now notice what reason, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. No way in which the devil could destroy Israel from the outside, through persecution. Because Israel was in a proper relationship with God, strong covenant relationship with God. As it says here, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. So the devil begins to think, he says, I'm not able to influence Balaam by money to curse Israel. God is protecting Israel. They're in a proper relationship with him. I cannot destroy them through persecution. What method could I use? And so suddenly he brings out of his filing cabinet the method that he had used before the flood. If you can't fight them, join them. And then if they become defiled with the inhabitants of the land, God will withdraw his protection and they will be easy to destroy. Notice Numbers chapter 31 and verse 16. It was Balaam who made this suggestion that, uh, that, that the children of Israel be enticed to commit idolatry and fornication, to become defiled with those Moabites. It says here in Numbers 31 and verse 16, Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the of in other words, God is saying, as long as you are in a proper relationship with me, there is nothing that the devil can do to destroy you from outside through persecution. So the devil says, if you can't fight them, join them. And so he brings believers and unbelievers together.
His protection. And the Bible says that 24,000 of the cream of the crop of Israel died because of their apostasy. Notice Numbers 20. Israel arrived at the borders of the promised land. They should have been willing to advance immediately into the promised land. But there's a very important little word here in Numbers 25 and verse 1. It says, then Israel, notice, remained in Acacia Grove. They remained in Acacia Grove. And the people began to commit adultery with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor and the anger of Peor. What the devil was not able to do through persecution, the devil was able to do through infiltration. Those are the two methods that the devil uses all throughout human history to try and conquer and overcome God's people by trying to destroy them physically, by trying to kill them by persecution, and the second me method is by infiltrating them, in other words, corrupting their principles and leading them to a wrong belief system. We have another example of this in Scripture. We have the case of Daniel and his three friends. Let's read from Daniel chapter 1. And we'll begin at verse 3. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 3. And I want you to notice three things that Nebuchadnezzar does with Daniel and his three friends. It says there, Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had abilities to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach, now notice this, they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. What was the idea of teaching these young men the literature and language of the Chaldeans? Through the educational system, it was to reprogram their way of thinking from Hebrew thinking into Babylonian thinking. But there was more. Notice what we find in verse 5. It says, And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which they drank. Interesting. Why would the devil want Daniel and his three friends to eat the food of Babylon and to drink the wine of Babylon. Simply because our physical habits have much to do with our moral ability to distinguish between right and wrong and to choose the right and reject the wrong. So not only is the devil trying to reprogram their thinking through the educational system of Babylon, he is also trying to lower their physical barriers and their mental barriers to sin by getting them to eat the food and drink the wine of Babylon. But there's more. Verse 5 again, And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And now notice this. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave what? Names. Why would Babylon want to change their names? What does a name indicate in Scripture? A name indicates the character of the person. To them the chief eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. In fact, these names were names in honor of the Babylonian gods. He hoped that as they listened to their names, their character would change as they the pantheon of Babylon. You know what's interesting? 
The Bible says that even though Daniel and his friends attended the educational system of Babylon, they did not allow their minds to be defiled. Not only that, when the food and when the wine was brought before them, they refused to eat. They chose a vegan diet. Water and vegetables. And do you know something else? Never in the book of Daniel do we find Daniel calling himself Belteshazzar. He's always called that by the Babylonians. But whenever Daniel speaks of himself, he says, I, Daniel... He did not allow the change of names to influence him. What was Babylon trying to do at this point? They were trying to convert the Hebrews into Babylonians. They were trying to corrupt them. And the devil was not able to do it. See, the devil works in both ways. He'll either kill you, and if he can't kill you, he'll infiltrate you. Or he'll try and infiltrate you, and if he can't, he'll kill you. Are you following what I'm saying? The two methods of the devil, he'll work both ways. And so the devil sees that these three young men and Daniel stand firm. They're not going to allow themselves to be defiled by the food, by the learning, by having names in honor of Babylonian gods. And so the devil says, I'm going to have to kill him. And so now you enter Daniel chapter 3. By the way, do you know that Daniel chapter 3 is a prophetic chapter? It's history. Yes, it took place in history, but it also is a prophecy. Did Nebuchadnezzar live for a, for a period as a beast, yes or no? Sure he did, for seven years. He thought he was a beast. Did he raise up an image? He most certainly did. Did he command everyone to worship the image? Yes, he did. Did he threaten that whoever did not worship the image that he had raised up would be killed? Absolutely. And who were the, who were the only ones who stood and refused to worship? The three young men. Daniel wasn't there for some reason. We'll have to ask in the kingdom why, where Daniel was. You know, there's all kinds of speculations. But we know that Daniel, if he had been there, he wouldn't have bowed either. Because later on he was willing to face the lions. At the end of his life, we know what his character was like. Maybe he was ill. Maybe this. King sent him on a trip. Maybe the king kept him someplace because he knew he wasn't going to worship. We don't know. But the three young men stood before the king. And I want to read the verses. Daniel chapter 3 and beginning with verse 16. Daniel 3 and verse 16. It says here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. You know, when you look at the historical context of this passage, they were standing before the monarch of the universe, so to speak, at that time, of the world, Nebuchadnezzar. All of the luminaries and dignitaries were gathered there. And this was embarrassing to Nebuchadnezzar because you have these three young men that refused to bow down and worship. Let me ask you, had they been contaminated with the teaching of Babylon? No. Were they living up to the meaning of their names, their Babylonian names? No. Was it worthwhile having clear minds and strong physical constitution to be able to stand for the truth? Absolutely yes. So they remain firm to God and the devil says, okay, if I can't infiltrate you, I will kill you. But the interesting thing is, we all know, all know the conclusion of the story. The Bible says that when they were thrown into the fiery furnace, clothing and all bound, Suddenly Nebuchadnezzar looks and he sees in the furnace not three but four. And the, the, the fourth one looks like the Son of God. Some people say, how did uh, Nebuchadnezzar know what the Son of God looked like? Well, the fact is that uh, Patri Prophets and Kings tells us that Daniel had described to Nebuchadnezzar what the Son of God was like, according to Scripture, because he had a physical description of him. And so Nebuchadnezzar knew what the Son of God looked like. And you know, when they were brought out of the fiery furnace, I mean, when God delivers, He really delivers fully and completely, doesn't He? 
I mean, the only thing that had burnt was the, the ropes that had them tied. It says not a hair of their heads was burnt, and they didn't even smell like smoke. That's what the text says. Because God intervened and he delivered his faithful followers. What I want us to notice in these examples that we've studied so far is that the devil uses two methods. Number one, he will try to undermine your principles. He will try to contaminate you with the world. He will try you to try to get you to follow false doctrines and false teachings, which are manifested then ultimately in behavior. If he can't do that, he'll say, the final solution, I'll kill you. But sometimes he works in the opposite way. He tries to, to destroy and to kill, and if he's not successful in doing that, he will try and infiltrate them. You know, during prayer, meet, prayer meetings in the last, uh, oh, I would say about four or five months, we've been studying the seven churches of the book of Revelation. It's been a fascinating study. Uh, we have a small group of people, probably about 20 to 25, that come out to prayer meeting. And uh, I wish the group was larger because we really have a good time. You know, I want you to know that I don't save the good stuff for Sabbath. You know, say, oh, prayer meeting, you know, that's, uh, you know, they save the, uh, the, the bee stuff. You know, no, we're studying real, real good stuff. We're studying the, the Church of Philadelphia right now. And I would encourage you to, to attend, uh, if at all possible, prayer meeting and to uh, delve into the Word with us. But anyway, we've been studying the seven churches, and I'd like to say something about the first three churches. The first church is Ephesus. That is the apostolic church, the church of the apostles. That's the church that went out and set the world on fire. That's the church that baptized thousands in one day. That's the church that soon not only baptized thousands, but started establishing churches all over the Roman Empire. They grew like grass fire. Then you have the second church. The second church is the church of Smyrna. If you read carefully the description in Revelation chapter 2, you'll find that Smyrna is the persecuted church. There's a lot of death language relating to the church of Smyrna. Uh, you know, God says, be faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. Uh, you know, Jesus introduces himself as he who was dead and, and yet is alive. Uh, you, the, na the name uh, Smyrna means bittersweet myrrh, British, bittersweet myrrh, and myrrh was used to embalm the dead. In other words, there's all sorts of death language connected to the church of Smyrna. Why? Because we find in history that when the apostolic church lived pious lives, and they proliferated the gospel message throughout the whole Roman Empire, Satan started losing his followers by droves. Christianity was growing, and the pagan temples were empty. And so the devil says, this is not convenient for me. And so he goes to the plan of persecution. The church of Ephesus is the conquering church, the church that wins thousands in a day. The devil says, under the church of Smyrna, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to persecute them. But you know, the interesting thing is that the more the devil persecuted, the more the church grew. So he says, it doesn't do any good to try and destroy them through persecution, because the more I try to destroy them, the more they are. And so now you enter the church of Pergamum and the church of Thyatira. This is the, the church of Pergamum is the church of the period of Constantine the Great. When suddenly Christianity joins the world, when Christianity is favored by the Roman emperor, and all sorts of false teachings enter the church in preparation for what we know as the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages, the period of the papal apostasy, which lasted 1260 years. In other words, the devil said, I'm not able to destroy them by persecution. What I'm going to do is I'm going to infiltrate them, lead them to fall in love with the world, follow the practices of the world, adopt the teachings of the world, and then if I corrupt them, God is not going to favor them. They'll be overcome. Allow me to read you a statement. I'm going to read you several statements now on these uh, first three churches of the book of Revelation. I'm going to read from the Spirit of Prophecy, Great Controversy, specifically page 46. Here Ellen White describes the faith of the early Christians, of the church of Ephesus. She says this, The early Christians were indeed a peculiar people. Today people don't want to be peculiar. 
No, we want to be one of the crowd. Right? We don't want to be different. We don't want to be called a cult. I don't like being called a cult. But, you know, we, many times we even call our churches, we don't call them Seventh-day Adventist churches, we call them Adventist Community Fellowship or Adventist, Adventist Community Church. Is it perhaps because we're embarrassed? She says the early Christians were indeed a peculiar people. Their blameless deportment and unswerving faith were a continual reproof that disturbed the sinner's peace. Though few in numbers, without wealth, position, or honorary titles, they were a terror to evildoers wherever their character and doctrines were known. Therefore, they were hated by the wicked. Even as Abel was hated by the ungodly Cain, for the same reason that Cain slew Abel did those who sought to throw off the restraint of the Holy Spirit put to death God's people. You see, you have this peculiar church whose lives are different than the world and they cause the world, of course, to react by persecution. And so I want you to notice that the devil attempts to destroy the early church because of their character. We find in the same page of Great Controversy, in vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the church of Christ by violence. He wasn't able to destroy the church by violence. Do you know that the church that is in a proper relationship with Christ is indestructible? There is an indestructibility to the people of God. Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell, which means Hades or the grave, shall not prevail against it. You can take it to the bank. She says, the great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when these faithful standard bearers fell at their post. By defeat, they conquered. Wait a minute. By defeat, they conquered? Would they have been defeated if they had given in to save their lives? Yes. But the fact that they were willing to die to be faithful to God showed that the devil could not overcome them. She continues saying, God's workmen were slain. But his work went steadily forward. The gospel continued to spread and the number of its adherents to increase. It penetrated into regions that were inaccessible even to the eagles of Rome. Said a Christian, expostulating with the heathen rulers who were urging forward the persecution, You may kill us, torture us, condemn us. Your injustice is the proof that we are innocent. Nor does your cruelty avail you. It was but a stronger invitation to bring others to their persuasion. The oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow, the blood of Christians is seed. The devil should have learned the lesson that the best method of getting rid of true Christianity is not by persecution. It takes a while even for the devil to learn. You know, by killing Cain, uh, killing Abel through Cain, God brings another seed. The devil had learned that infiltrating the seed before the flood worked much better. Only eight left. But evidently he didn't learn well enough to, to, to apply it here in the Christian church. He rises persecution first. The more the church grows. Is it perhaps true that it might be a good idea to have a little persecution today? You know, we praise the Lord. We say, oh, thank you, Lord, for the times of peace. And we sit in front of the television set for hours and hours. Thanks for the times of peace. Dare I speak boldly? Perhaps the only thing, folks, that is going to uh, lift us up from our pews and, and lead us to come to prayer meeting, where we not only study, but we also pray, and we have a testimony service. And when Pastor Jensen leads, they sing. What is it going to take? Now notice Satan's plan B when the church grew phenomenally. 
Satan therefore laid his plans to war more successfully against the government of God by planting his banner in the Christian church. Is that what he did in the days of Balaam? Absolutely. If the followers of Christ could be deceived and led to displease God, then their strength, fortitude, and firmness would fail and they would fall on easy prey. It's like she's describing what happened in the days of Balaam. She continues saying, the great adversary now endeavored to gain by artifice what he had failed to secure by force. Persecution ceased. And in its stead were substituted the dangerous allurements of temporal prosperity and worldly honor. Idolaters were led to receive a part of the Christian faith while they rejected other essential truths. Is it just possible that we're filling the church with a mixed multitude? People who are not fully and completely committed to all of our message. She continues saying they profess to accept Jesus as the Son of God and to believe in His death and resurrection. But they had no conviction of sin and felt no need of repentance or of a change of heart. With some concessions on their part, they proposed that Christians should make concessions, that all might unite on the platform of belief in Christ. Unite on the platform of what? We all believe in Jesus. That's ecumenism, as it's being spoken of today. Let's join on, on the points that we have in common. We all believe in the same Lord. We're all going to the same place. She continues saying, this is page 42 and 43 of Great Controversy. She says, now the church was in fearful peril. Prison, torture, fire, and sword were blessings in comparison with this. Some of the Christians stood firm, declaring that they could make no compromise. Others were in favor of yielding or modifying some features of their faith and uniting with those who had accepted a part of Christianity, urging that this might be the means of their full conversion. Did you catch that? You know, if we just concede a little bit, we'll reach all those unchurched out there. If we just worship the way that they're comfortable worshiping. You know, if we allow in church the behavior that they uh, partake of. If we use, you know, instead of preaching a sermon, we show a movie now and then. They'll feel more comfortable in our midst. It's happening now in the Adventist church, folks. Quiet in here. She continues saying, that was a time of deep anguish to the faithful followers of Christ. Under a cloak of pretended Christianity, Satan was insinuate, insinuating himself into the church to corrupt their faith and turn their minds from the word of God. See how the devil works? Persecution and infiltration. And he does them in both orders. Persecution, infiltration, or infiltration and persecution. It doesn't make any difference to him. If he can't get you one way, he will get you another way. Now, I would like to uh, dedicate my concluding remarks to a passage from the Spirit of Prophecy where Ellen White is discussing a meeting that she saw in vision of Satan and his angels to plan the strategy for God's remnant church in the last days. Now, I must say that, though I'm going to read this passage from the writings of Ellen White, what she says is contained already in Scripture, primarily Matthew 24 and 25, Luke 21, where Jesus speaks about being prepared for, for his second coming. Jesus said, pray, watch, don't be caught up by the cares of this world. Lest that day catch you unawares. Now, I, I, I'm not going to read the whole passage. It's in Testimonies to Ministers, uh, pages uh, 473 to 475. 
I'm just going to mention a few of Ellen White's comments in the first half of this chapter, and then I'm going to dedicate my remarks especially to the second half of uh, this chapter. It's called The Snares of Satan. In the first half of this chapter, Ellen White speaks about Satan influencing the religious world to move for the establishment of laws which restrict and remove liberty of conscience. She speaks about the religious and political powers of the world joining forces to actually implement a Sunday law which will force God's people to observe Sunday as the day of worship. I'd just like to read the concluding section of this uh, first part of the chapter, The Snares of Satan. This is the culmination of the devil's first method, which is to restrict religious liberty and ultimately to persecute and try to destroy God's people by destroying them from the place of, face of the earth through persecution. She says this. Satan here is speaking. She's hearing him speak. We led the Romish church to inflict imprisonment, torture, and death upon those who refused to yield to her decrees. And now that we are bringing the Protestant churches and the world into harmony with this right arm of our strength, notice the threefold union, we will finally have a law to exterminate all who will not submit to our authority when death shall be made the penalty of violating our Sabbath. Then many who are now ranked with commandment keepers will come over to our side. But do you know that this method of the devil is the last resort? This method of a Sunday law and a death decree against God's people who observe his holy Sabbath, this is only the last resort that he's going to use for those that he is not able to conquer first through another method. Allow me to continue reading this statement. She says, the devil once again is saying these words, but before proceeding to these extreme measures, so catch that? Before what? Proceeding to these extreme measures. What extreme measures? Sunday law, a death decree to exterminate God's faithful people. She says that before this, something's going to happen. She says, before proceeding to these extreme measures, we must exert all our wisdom and subtlety to deceive and ensnare those who honor the true Sabbath. So who's the target before the, the, the world, before uh, papacy and Protestantism joining with the powers of the world, give this Sunday law and this death decree? Who is the target of the devil's work? Sabbath keepers. But before proceeding to these extreme measures, we must exert all our wisdom and subtlety to deceive and ensnare those who honor the true Sabbath. We, now notice this, we can separate many from Christ by worldliness, lust, and pride. Wow. Worldliness, lust, and pride. They may think themselves safe, because they believe the truth, but indulgent, indulgence of appetite or the lower passions, which will confuse judgment and destroy discrimination, will cause their fall. You notice the, what she's listing here? She says once again, worldliness, lust, Pride, appetite, or feeding the lower passions, confuses judgment. She goes on. The devil is speaking to his angels. Go, make the possessors of lands and money drunk with the cares of this life. What place does money occupy in your list of priorities? She continues saying, present the world before them in its most attractive light. 
that they may lay up their treasure here and fix their affections upon earthly things. Only we can answer if we're doing that. Do we have far more than what we need? While the work of God is languishing? And the church is in need? You say, oh, it's easy for you to say that because our budget is behind. Yes, our budget is behind. But I don't say it because of our budget. I say it because of us. It's not about the church having the money. It's about us having the heart to return the money that belongs to God. She continues saying, we must do our utmost to prevent those who labor in God's cause from obtaining means to use against us. Means means money. She continues saying, keep the money in our own ranks. The more means they obtain, the more they will injure our kingdom by taking from us our subjects. Make them care more for money than for the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom. And the spread of the truths we hate. And we need not fear their influence. For we know that every selfish, covetous person will fall under our power. And will finally be separated from God's people. Now listen. Through those who have a form of godliness. You understand what that means? A form of godliness? We go through all the routine and all the... All the forms and all the ceremonies, we come and go from church. Through those who have a form of godliness, but know not the power, the devil says we can gain many who would otherwise do us harm. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God will be our most effective helpers. Those of this class who are apt and intelligent will serve as decoys to draw others into our snares. Many will not fear their influence because they profess the same faith. We will thus lead them to conclude that the requirements of Christ are less strict than they once believed. See, lowering the standard, lowering, uh, according to this, the requirements of Jesus. And that by conformity to the world, they would exert a greater influence with worldlings. Thus they will separate from Christ. Then they will have no strength to resist our power. And ere long, they will be ready to ridicule their former zeal and devotion. Until the great decisive blow shall be struck, our efforts against commandment keepers must be untiring. We must be present at all their gatherings. He's here today. Whispering in people's ears. Trying to get you to go to sleep. She continues saying, in their large meetings, especially our cause will suffer much. And we must exercise great vigilance and employ all our seductive, seductive arts to prevent souls from hearing the truth and becoming impressed by it. I will have upon the ground as my agents men holding false doctrines mingled with just enough truth to deceive souls. See, here you have heresy. Not only lifestyle issues, not only money, not only pride, not only worldliness, but also false doctrines mingled with the truth. Folks, we need to know our Bibles. What would happen if you only ate once a week, physically speaking? Tell me, what would happen if we ate once a week? We wouldn't be alive very long, right? And yet many Adventists, their only meal is the sermon on Sabbath morning, spiritually speaking. And that's why, as the Church of Sardis, we have a name that we're alive, but we're what? We're dead. I will have upon the ground as my agents men holding false doctrines mingled with just enough truth to deceive souls. I will also have unbelieving ones present who will express doubts in regard to the Lord's messages of warning to his church. Should the people read and believe these admonitions, she's speaking about her writings, by the way, we 
could have little hope of overcoming them. But if we can divert their attention from these warnings, they will remain ignorant of our power and cunning, and we shall secure them in our ranks at last. In fact, Ellen White speaks of a group in the time of trouble that cried out to God and they said, Why didn't you tell us that this time was going to be so terrible so that we could pre be prepared? And God is going to say, I did warn you. I gave you testimonies of the Spirit and you chose to ignore them and to reject them. Now more than ever, we should be reading the Spirit of Prophecy and implementing the principles into our lives. Because they are biblical principles. They amplify, they explain the principles that we contain in Scripture. She continues saying, speaking about the devil, speaking, God will not permit his words to be slighted with impunity. If we can keep souls deceived for a time, God's mercy will be withdrawn and he will give them up to our full control. And now notice this. We must cause distraction and division. We must destroy their anxiety for their own souls and lead them to criticize, to judge, and to accuse and condemn one another and to cherish selfishness and enmity. So if there's strife in the church, we know where it comes from. For these sins, God banished us from his presence and all who follow our example will meet a similar fate. That's Satan's plan for the remnant church. Not to destroy them first. That's the last resort. That's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If, you know, I can't corrupt them, they remain firm, I'm going to kill them. It's the same thing that the devil's going to do at the end of time. He's going to try to corrupt God's people by worldliness, by pride, by the love of money, by criticism, by, by all of these things that we've described in this passage, which is also found in Matthew 24 and 25. But there's still going to, be, going to be a group that will not bow to the power of the devil. And so the devil is going to say, if I cannot corrupt them, I am going to destroy them from the face of the earth. And then only those who really know Jesus as their personal Savior will be willing to die in order to be faithful to him. I'd like to conclude by reading one statement that we find in Great Controversy, page 48. You know, you, we, we rejoice that we live in a country where there's no persecution, where there's freedom to worship God according to the dictates of our conscience. And I say, praise the Lord. It's nice to live in a country like this. God has been good to the United States. It's based on wonderful principles. Separation of church and state, full religious liberty, to worship God according to the dictates of our conscience. It's marvelous. But I believe that the time is coming when God is going to have to take measures into his own hands, and he's going to have to allow some persecution to come in to sift the church. Notice this statement, closing statement. There is another and more important question that should engage the attention of the churches of today. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then she asks this question. Why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? Why no persecution? If those who live piously in Christ Jesus will suffer, will suffer, doesn't say might, it says will suffer persecution. Why is there no persecution? Here's her answer. The only reason, how many reasons? One. The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. The religion which is current in our day is not of a pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin. Because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded. Because there is so little vital godliness in the church. That Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. And then she gives this warning. Let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church 
and the spirit of persecution will be revived, and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. So what is God waiting for? I guess God is waiting for more signs than the sun, moon, and stars. He's waiting for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. No. What he's doing is he's waiting for a people. A people who will get serious about the Lord. A people who will make, make that kingdom number one on the list. The kingdom of God and its righteousness. Not the added things. Folks, the day is coming when everything that we possess is going to burn. And the more we have, the more is going to burn. Do we really need everything that we have? Or should we place it on the altar of sacrifice? To be used in the finishing of God's work on earth so we can go home. Kind of reminds me of a chapter in early writings where Ellen White says that during the time of trouble, you know, there will be many people, this is a short time of trouble before the close of probation, where God's people will not be able to get rid of their properties. Can't buy or sell. And she heard them crying out and lamenting before God how we could have taken the funds that we had, the excess that we didn't need, and we could have invested it in the cause of God, and souls could have been saved, and now we can't get rid of our property for any price. In fact, the Bible says that, that uh, the time is coming when people will take their silver and their gold. Ezekiel 7, verse 19 says people will take their silver and their gold, and they will throw it in the streets. They say, what good is this silver and this gold? We're lost. Eternally lost. And it's no good to us anymore. I pray to God, folks, this morning that we will get serious about the order of things in our lives. That we will fulfill what Jesus spoke about in, in Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all of these things will be added unto you. Don't put the added things first and then think that the kingdom of God will come as a result. We must place the kingdom of God and its righteousness first. And then the added things will come in their train. Folks, we're living on the brink of eternity. I believe that what we're seeing in the world shows that we're living in the last moments of time. What will our priorities be? The answer to that question is in our hearts and our minds. This week on 3EBN Today Live, we'll have music, inspiration, and powerful messages from the Word of God. Join us this Thursday at 8 p.m. Central, right here on 3ABN. Patience is a virtue, a God-given talent. James 5, 7 and 8 say, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. 
You see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until we receive the early and latter rain. You will also be patient. Establish your heart 